Good afternoon. You're coming to you from beautiful, scenic downtown Rancho Mirage, California. We are very, very excited today to have Ron Shelton, the director and author of many wonderful movies, among them Bull Durham, which we're going to focus on because Ron has a great book called The Church of Baseball, which is getting embarrassingly good reviews in every angle. Uh, Ron, you apparently have made the uh, hat trick work in which you're both a literary icon and a rugged redneck all at the same time. Well, I, you know, I'm just happy to be here and hope I can help the ball club. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right. Um, let me just say, born in Whittier, 1945, Ron Shelton still carries from my money the swagger of a professional athlete. He has a very deep and wry sense of humor and a dangerous edge. You would want him on your side in a bar fight. <laughs> um, Ron combines an unbelievable passion for storytelling, which I am very much in the shadow of and appreciative of, genuine intellect, willingness to hang out in a good bar almost any day. He's a straight shooter, complicated man, full of romance and whimsy, and disdain for establishment rules and expectations. He has been a ditch digger. He has been a cleaning crew dog, a pro baseball player in the International League, gone to various colleges, written and directed easily five or six of the smartest, best, most literate movies of our time, among many other films. And uh, I'll just say he describes lovingly the kind of slow motion car wreck that is life in America. He is genuinely an American icon. Um, we met together around a screenplay called A Player to be Named Later. That's, we'll investigate all that in just a minute. And uh, Ron, Bill Getty, you know, uh, at least briefly. And Bill, I think you had the singular fun of watching Bull Durham again last night. Okay, I watched it. Uh, uh, we're going to let Ron talk eventually. But let me start out with this. I watched this movie when I, when I, in 1988, and we did an hour on this, just yeah. you and me, because you greenlit this film. We were very involved in getting this thing off the ground. And I spoke to you as a 33-year-old. I realized this at this stage. What I just saw, the movie I just saw, was the movie that my father said to me when I was thought I was on top of the world and I was the executive producer of The View and the Barbara Walters specials, and, I was, and he says, someday you will have a midlife crisis. And I said, well, when does that happen? He says, it's, it, it happens. It's not about a, it's age. You could be 25, you could be 85. He says, it happens when you realize that that thing you think you are going to be is never going to occur. And he says, and how you deal with that in your life will determine how happy you are or unhappy you are the rest of your life. And boy, was he right. And so when I saw it, the movie I saw when I was 33, I thought was about talent and why it was given to some people and not others. The movie I saw last night was about that reckoning that yeah. happens in everyone's life. Am I, am I making it too simple, Ron? No, I, I think that's exactly what it's about. And <clears throat> it's about the reckoning that the woman, Annie Savoy, um, played so wonderfully by Susan Sarandon, uh, also has. There, there yes. are two people whose lives come together and they force each other's reckoning. So yep. I think that, that is indeed why maybe why the movie seems to have lasted so well. Yeah, she has a sort of arrested development and so she grows up too. So like, so by the end of the movie, I mean, I'm assuming everybody's seen this movie, by the end of the movie, you can see in her face, because she's, she's just so fantastic in this, you can see in her face, and I guess she's so well-directed, I will add, that she's in love for the first time. She's never been in this situation before. She's sitting on the porch there, and she's like, no more boys. I've got to grow up. And he's going, i got to grow up too, basically. That's, what, that's the gist of it, right? Am I, is, 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 basically, am I right on this? Exactly. Yes, they they both been playing with boys, and uh, um, there's a time in your life. Unfortunately, you can't play with boy games anymore um, <laughs> because it's it's a pretty yeah. great way to live and to make your living until you can't. It also is a way to push down the road that reckoning that we talk about. Uh, in other words, Annie has set up her life so that she has one guy, monogamous during the season that she trains and has wild sex with 
and he's gone in September. So yeah. it, she never has to take the risks that a real relationship demands because long-term relationships are difficult and um, aren't as romantic as they are in the books and in the movies. And she knows that. She won't admit it, but she knows it. Crash knows it immediately because yeah. he's, he's never met a woman like this on the road either. He's a man of, we assume, one night and two night stands, and he has never had to face the risk of a real relationship. So they have private reckonings that are actually shared if they're going to try to go forward together. So that's I, I think that's what the movie's about. You know, you and I have now known each other a long time. We've worked together on and off for a long time. And I consider you one of the most uh, erudite and reasonably well-educated from the point of view of literature people that I know, you know? And I include Scott Berg and a bunch of other ducks that we know who are uh, understood in popular culture as intellectuals. But you're my favorite closet intellectual. <laughs> and and it shows up in your fucking work. It just shows up. We were talking about Tin Cup earlier and how smart Tin Cup is in its way, you know, and the ending to that movie, which is profoundly smart and interesting and doesn't let you off the hook. It's really, uh, it's very cool. There's a bit in the book about, <clears throat> you know, I came out of college a reader but I, I, I have, you know, I fell in love with nonsense verse in college. That was the first thing that got me into writing, you know, uh, Lewis Carroll right. and that stuff, uh, just because it was fun. And I would write reams of my own nonsense verse. But again, you can't tell the guys on the baseball team. <laughs> uh, the, you know, you can't quote, "'Twas Billig in the slithy toe, did Guy and Gimble in the wet." You know, they, they think <laughs> you're nuts. So um, I, I wrote my own. But in the minors, I, I didn't like to play cards on these long bus trips, so I would read. Right. And um, and the old trope that you would you know hide, hide uh, you know Hustler magazine uh, you know uh, you know behind a, a, a your Shakespeare volume, you had to flip that. You had to uh, you had to show Hustler and put. The, the real the literature inside the hustler cover <laughs> so that people didn't <laughs> get alarmed um in one summer this is it this is in the book i remember the summer in rochester i got hooked on thomas mon and mickey's Pauline. so <laughs> great combo uh, i was reading magic mountain and all these things kiss me deadly uh, and, and kiss me deadly it's in the book yes. and um yeah i just am sort of still like that yeah, I love it. Well, and you know, the Bull Durham actually, uh, I, I, there aren't many movies that, uh, about sports that have a genuine uh, soliloquy almost, I guess, in essence, with, it, at, the, at the top of the movie, right? Yeah. I mean, basically, he walked the I Believe, the I Believe, uh, and yeah. Oswald acted alone on the small of a woman's back, and blah, blah. I mean, that's the kind of thing that would get knocked out of a picture today, don't you think? I mean, I, it feels like that. It's like that's it's the, one of the great scenes in a, in a movie not just a sports movie, but a movie. Yet I can see today somebody going, you know, people don't talk like that. Uh, well, I've had trouble getting movies made lately, as Tom knows, because they're full <laughs> of stuff like that. And then you're dealing with people who, who just can't read. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. But that, you know, the book starts, well, I think when I started somewhere chapter three, I, I was driving around the Carolina League because... Tom paid for me to go down there and um, to see if there's still the minor leagues hadn't changed because the major leagues had changed because since I played they were very they were now very corporate and you know if you wanted to talk to a major league player you had to go through his handlers and his lawyer and his publicist and his agent and you know manager well in the old days if you were a reporter or a photographer you'd hang around the Yankees batting cage and say hey Mickey can I take a picture yeah you know yeah. So, yeah. and the minor leagues, well, I, I drove all, I rented a car, and I drove all over, from not just hanging out in Durham, Asheville, Columbus, uh, um, Greensboro. I, I can't even remember all those towns. I went, to, I went and hung out alone, and ball players 
were talking to the fans and, and 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 sending notes to girls back and forth. It was just like I remembered it. Yeah. And and um, so on a drive from Durham down to Asheville, I went on the back roads, stay off the interstates, and I uh, and I wanted to go by the old Black Mountain College where you right. know John right. Cage and everybody talked, which is not there for forty years, but I still wanted to go back. And I had a dictaphone. I used to carry a little tiny. And I said, well, okay, a woman's got to tell the story because I told that to Tom Mount, and I, didn't, I don't know what the story is. <laughs> and, Small problem. Well, there was a whole chapter about pitching it, and I didn't walk across the parking lot trying to figure out what it was, then walking away with a deal and saying, I just sold something. I don't have anything. So, Do you, um, do you remember your three-word pitch? Yeah, Four-word pitch. Lissa Strata in the minor leagues. That's right. That was the pitch. And I got to say, I was so fucking happy to hear that. Try running a mo movie fucking studio, Ron. You cannot imagine the amount of dreck you listen to on a daily basis every 30 minutes from people. I, I, I will say we had an executive at Universal who fancied himself deeply literate. Ned Tannen used to say of him, he wrote one episode of The Virginian and thought he was Faulkner. <laughs> <laughs> well, the um, yeah, the back to that point. On, on the drive to Asheville, I started. I said, "Well, I wonder what she sounds like." She, well, she says, "I believe in the Church of Baseball. I worshipped all the major religions, most of the minor ones." And that was simply because I knew many, many, many women. Because out of the '60s, it is now 20 years later. So, those women that I knew in the '60s were now approaching 40 right and uh in the 60s which really ended in the mid 70s you know everybody was on a journey and women were on their journeys and men were on their journeys and it was sex drugs rock and roll and eastern philosophies and vietnam and i mean and violence and assassinations so i just by the time i got to Asheville, i had the whole opening monologue and i didn't I put it in my pocket and about two months later I'm back in LA and I started I typed it up. Yeah. Well it's and, a, it's a, and, it, and then, then I wrote the whole script. Well, I will say Bill's point's a really good one because that movie is full of really distinct, meaningful, move the plot forward, thoughtful soliloquy. It opens with one and then there are several more in sequence. And it's really interesting to me that what Parade Magazine calls in this upcoming Sunday cover that you have, congratulations, by the way. We have uh, it, we have it, it's and, about us. And, and, well, it's about your movie, and it's about the film you wrote, and if you hadn't written, if you hadn't said Lys, Lys Estrada in the minor leagues, none of this <laughs> would have moved forward, you know? And so what's interesting to me about that is they call it on the cover Best sports film ever made. Well, you've heard that a lot about Bull Drum and other movies you've made, I might, might add. And I've heard that a lot. And the listing I'm most fond of is a listing that I saw some time ago in Vanity Fair that it was a listing of most romantic films ever made, and Bull Durham was number two. Hmm. <laughs> well, well I, let, me, let me just say, Tom, and, and this is also in the book, the... I, and when I said Lissa Strada in the minor leagues, and, and I actually had a producer who not only knew Lissa Strada, he knew what the infield fly rule was. <laughs> that is, a, that is, that is a very hard hyphenate to find. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, which is why it was a perfect uh, marriage. Did you have favorite movies in college or pre-college as a kid growing up? I would say college and soon after college. Um, there were three, even though I, I, I didn't like sports movies, there were three great sports movies made at that time that still are great. One was The Hustler. Right, yeah, great movie. Um, one was, which I watched again recently, and it held up, This Sporting Life. Yeah. Mm. Um, English movie, Lindsay Anderson, Richard Harris, playing a rugby player. Um, it, it was sort of that kitchen sink school Yes. It's about the athlete <laughs> who is lost everywhere except on the field. Right. And that's what <laughs> most athletes are. Um, 
another non-sports movie that I saw, and I talk about this a lot, this was in the minor leagues, it was my kind of road to Damascus. I saw The Wild Bunch. I was in Little Rock, Arkansas in the Texas League, and I, and I saw The Wild Bunch. And it kind of blew my head off, and I went to yeah. see it all four days before we went to the ballpark. Right. And, and I became, you know, a, a, I really studied Peckinpah, and even though our movies looked to be quite different, and and my crews, I was adopted as a screenwriter by one of Peckinpah's editors, and one of his writers is now my editor. So I, I kind of, there was a lot about Sam that I loved. I thought his movies were misread a lot. I thought he was very <laughs> a humanist yeah. um, and a, a compellingly complex, troubled guy who made a handful of great movies and one masterpiece called The Wild Bunch. So um, that, those are the movies that moved me. I mean, as a kid, I didn't allow to go to movies because I grew up in this Baptist family. No swearing, no drinking, no um, movies. So I became a foul-mouthed alcoholic film director, if you believe. <laughs> yeah, which makes That's a it. lot of but sense. Uh, and, but, you know, yes. I'd love to know how many people's lives have been changed by seeing The Wild Bunch because it's by far my favorite movie. I went to see it when I was 14. We snuck in. We weren't supposed to get in because it was, it was rated R or whatever that was back then, M, whatever it was. And uh, and I stayed in three times. I kept calling my mom on the payphone saying, don't come pick me up yet. We're watching it one more time. Yes. Uh, and, and, it, and in it is this world-weary, I'm getting somewhere with this, this world-weary guy that, that basically William Holden made a living playing, right? And uh, the Pike Bishop. And in some ways... I think Crash has a little of that, don't you think? That kind of like that uh, the idea that he's he loves the game, but the game doesn't love him, or something. Well, that, yeah, exactly. That, that, about ten years after the movie came out, somebody wrote about the movie. It's about a man who loves something more than it loves him back. Yeah. And I and and, and that that it, that was exactly right. And I hadn't thought of that. I've quoted it ever since, as if it was my idea. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, those guys, Deke, you know, Robert Ryan, Deke, and Pike, and all those guys love something that is not there to be had anymore. Right. Yeah. No, it's it's completely true, and and it is that dislocation, and it is also that uh, sense of hurt that you disguise with a lot of acting out that drives the whole picture forward. I think. I mean, honestly, nobody gets through life without disappointment. Nobody gets through life without a reckoning. Nobody gets through life without having to figure out which side is up for real. And so your movie opens those doors big time for all of us. Um, let me ask another silly question because I'm trying to, I'm going somewhere with these. Did you have favorite movie stars? Uh, well, given that I didn't go to movies as a kid. Yeah. Uh, until high school, I, I started sneaking in. The same as you did, Bill, yeah. um, as a kid or as a teenager. Well, I remember seeing the first movie, the first Bond movie, Doctor No, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, undeniably cool. Uh, and I thought, well, and I went. And I was sixteen. I went and bought a gray suit downtown, thinking I would look like Sean Connery. Uh, <laughs> it didn't. Yeah. It didn't work. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, William Holden. I mean, yeah. he's in some of my favorite movies: Sunset Boulevard, Wild Bunch, and and uh, Network. Give me a break. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. One, guy, one guy's in all those. Right. Yeah. yeah. I know. And Lumet used to say to me that it was his favorite person to work with as an actor. Wow. You know, I heard a little bit from Tom uh, the obstacles that kept this movie from happening. Do you <laughs> <laughs> a little bit? A yeah. little bit, yeah. Not a little. I mean, a, a lot. What what is what was the ob what was the biggest obstacle to get over to get this? Every movie has some sort of story about how nobody wanted it or no. What, I mean, I assume this had the same sorts of things. Yes. Yeah. We, well, it was turned down by every studio twice, with Kevin Costner attached, and and it was a fluke. It got made. It, it's in the book. I mean, it, it was a fluke. Um, they didn't want Costner, or they didn't want the movie. They don't want uh, either. Uh, well, oh. first time, first time director of baseball. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'd written two movies that were 
not successful except Pauline Kael and some critics loved them, but they didn't do business. Um, so how dare I call myself a director? I, I'd done second unit, but everybody does second unit. What are those movies b before you go on? What, what movies had you written? First one was called Under Fire, about the Nicaraguan Revolution. Sure, and, uh, I remember that. Which Gene is Hackman, Jean-Louis Trantillon. Yeah, it's a Nicole good movie. Yeah, yeah. And, and Kale loved it. Yeah. And, and some loved it and some didn't. And then a movie with Robin Williams and Kurt Russell called The Best of Times, yeah. which, which I didn't direct uh, but wanted to. Um, and uh, yeah, based on that, I decided I was a director. But I think first-time director, nobody got minor league baseball. Why doesn't he make it to the major leagues? You know, um, this, there's a whole chapter on the struggles of that because, you know, uh, Tom was in, making a movie in Paris. He was back and forth. We had a 25-year-old co-producer, Mark Berg. I was going into meetings alone that I got there and I realized that this they're not interested. They just don't want to say no to Kevin Costner because he might become a star. You know, I mean, there was all of that. We're running time. Um, and I was saying, if it's just in focus, you're going to get your money back. There was no foreign sales. There were big concern. Uh, it's, yeah. all, it's, all, it's all in the book. It, it just... Uh, a total fluke that we got it off the ground. You know what? It was occurred to me that we talked to the first, I'm going to say, ten or fifteen minutes about this movie without talking about baseball, which yeah, is, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So, so I, you, you don't, you don't really have to like baseball at all. You know, I mean, I, I, I played golf late in life, but when I first saw Ten Cup, I, I still think it's one of the, the best sports movies ever, and uh, and I'd never played a round of golf and I didn't understand it, but I understood the movie. So I think, and I think Bull Durham transcends that much more so than even Tin Cup. I yeah. mean, it is really, you don't have to, you don't have to have any interest in baseball at all to th be thrilled by the movie. So let me just expand just slightly on what Ron said. And he's right. I was making another movie with Polanski in, in uh, Paris and I was having to commute back and forth to LA. So I was in some meetings, not in others. Ron had a lot of the weight on his shoulders. Um, I was not worried at all about Ron being a first-time director for a lot of reasons. Uh, I'd seen this work he'd done previously. I'd seen his second unit work. I looked at some of that. And I'd gotten to know the guy. And honestly, Ron, if you don't inspire confidence in a producer, nothing can. So it's just, you know, you are a um, straight arrow human. What you see is what you get. And that is so fucking reassuring in Hollywood, I can't tell you. So... Well, uh, thank you, and uh, uh, it's a, also a point of the of the book of, of the battles. It's subtitled "The Boars, the Whatever, the Battles, the Bloody Bat." Every movie has those. But um, and Tom and I had ours, and I, I mean, I beat up another producer on the set. And I thought which which he richly it. deserved, I might add, a total fucking well, punk. I mean, it, it got bloody. Uh, the the um, but uh, you know, I was determined to make a movie that I liked because I thought maybe I'll never get a chance to make a movie again. At least I'll say, well, I made that one. That's a sports movie. But I turned in the first draft of the script. This starts one of the chapters. But when you turn in a script, Bill, you, you probably know this. From, you're waiting for five pages of notes that are that are so off point and so confusing. And, and it's like, why am I in business with this yeah, person? Disheartening, I would think. Yeah, and, and, and incomprehensible, really. And, yes. and it's the first draft, and Tom says, I love it, let's make it, honest to God. <laughs> and, then, and then after all the battles, he, he looks at the first cut of a movie. I screened it for him, I think, alone, Tom wrote. That's right, it was alone. And, yeah. and first cuts, you know, if you're the director, all you see are the problems that haven't been solved yet. And Tom said, that's the best first cut I've ever seen. Keep Whatever you're doing, keep doing. Yeah. Now, you can't find a producer who says, I love it, let's make it. Yeah. Ron, let, let me just be clear about this. I developed, supervised, financed, distributed and marketed 220 movies in 13 years at Universal. I have seen a lot of fucking first cuts. A whole lot. I was telling you the truth. That was the best first cut of a movie. It had balance. It had intelligence. It knew what it was about. It had both feet on the ground. Not everything was perfect. 
we had some struggles around issues and, and all of that. Let me just amplify a little bit on the resistance to the film. Um, and I'll name a few of these people because they deserve it. Um, there was a guy named Mark Canton who was running Warner Brothers. I knew Mark Canton well. I pushed the movie with him very hard. He looked me in the eye and said, Kevin Costner is not a movie star and never will be. Pass. Fox said, as you may remember, we'll make this if you guys can make it for two or three million dollars, but mm. it's not worth more than that. Mm. Our budget was not large, but it was more than two or three million dollars. Also, even when we stumbled our way into Orion and Jeff Berg finally finished a deal with Bill for all of us to get this thing going, and we were losing the summer, and we were going to have to shoot in the fucking winter, and a lot of other problems. Metavoy was a nightmare, from my point of view. I mean, here's a guy who told me on the phone, Susan Sarandon is too old, and she's not sexy. You know, he changed his mind after Susan um, convinced him, I think, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, it just, she was... She that was sounds right. terrible. I'm sure that's not... You don't mean it exactly that way. Well, I mean... Well, no, it's story, it's a story is in the book, of, and I'll tell it now. Tell it. Susan, Susan, there is something called The List, which I used in capital T, capital L in the book. Every studio has the list of actors or actresses that they consider bankable at, at the moment you need to cast a movie. The problem is everybody's list is different and it changes weekly. So our list of actresses who were auditioning, it, it, you know, they were going on and off the list, you know, and, but the one name that they wouldn't approve was Sarandon. We couldn't understand why. She flew from Italy where she lived with her two year old daughter and a nanny on her own dime from Italy to LA to audition. And her agent said, I, I don't believe she, she must not be on the list. I couldn't say she's not on the list because that would betray a studio confidence. So I kept saying, well, she's just not right. But I didn't believe it. She came over. She auditioned. She was great. She she just owned the room. She pushed Kevin around. She was great. Spectacular. And, we, and then we're all sitting around late in the day. It was Tom's office wondering, what are we going to do? Because she's not on the list. An hour later, Metavoy calls. And I get along with my, I mean, I fought with him like cat and dog on the movie, but uh, I t tend to get along with people I fight with uh, <laughs> after the fact. The, the, um, he calls and says, you know, I saw Sarandon a couple of weeks ago. She looks great. Let's, I have put her on the list. Well, I knew she was in Italy a couple of weeks ago, and I knew she left the office an hour ago. So she went over. She had this killer red and white striped tube dress, which she could wear. And she went over to the halls of Orion and worked her way around the hall until she could found Mike and said, hi, Mike, how are you? And he called us and said, she's on the list. So Susan deserves a lot of credit for <laughs> yeah. willfully yes. changing the mind of the studio. And then they still didn't like the way she looked. And, and there were, it, we had fights at the DP and, the, and Tim Robbins they wanted to get rid of. So the battles went on and on and on, which I talk about in the book and the trades that were made and the sacrifices and the, you know the, but it's hard to believe that even through shooting they didn't like the way she looked believe it or not true well um, right? that's completely true and as you remember we traded out her hair we traded out the uh, dp but before that happened ron i just want to remind you that one week into dailies one week into dailies medavoy called me in north carolina i'd driven down from Philadelphia, where we were finishing a little Jodie Foster movie, and he said, you got to fire the director. And I said, oh, okay, uh, why? And he said, well, because the movie's not funny. I looked at these dailies, they're not funny. Well, first of all, I know Mike Metavoy since he was a fucking tiny agent at Ashley Famous 10,000 years ago. Secondly, I never believe he looked at dailies. Thirdly, he's talking to me like some kind of studio dog it's Orion, for God's sake, on the brink of perpetual bankruptcy. We were lucky to have them, but they were lucky to have us. And I have a really bad attitude about studio executives having been one for way too long. So the solution to not firing the director was replacing the DP. Right. That was my trade-off. 
And, I know. And you were very unhappy about that, but you were also really understanding about it because it was not, it was not optional. We had to make some kind of move that Mike could hide behind as the influence he'd had on the movie. And they and I talked about that, and I said I knew my job was in jeopardy, and I knew that the DP and some of the most beautiful stuff of Su Susan and the rain he had shot, but and, and Tim was also there was an executive at Orion trying to get rid of Tim. Yes, um, I, I call him throughout the book the unnamed executive. <laughs> uh huh. Would you like to name him now? No. <laughs> okay. No, because. Uh, I, I, I think it's better this way. Have you had in your life a favorite director? Is there one director, is it Peckinpah, that you just say, that's it? Well, I, I love the movies of Preston Sturgis a great deal, and I love the movies of Billy Wilder a great deal, the, the range and the literacy uh, I, I, without giving up the genre. Right. Uh, I, I, I love those guys. Um, so... How did you put up with all that, Ron? You remained pretty fucking strong and resolute, and you stayed focused on the movie, from my point of view. Well, all, all you can do is what, what control is what you can control, and uh, I, I, and I certainly didn't know the movie. I, I was making the movie I wanted to make, even if nobody liked it, and uh, um, and I did believe it worked, and there was always audiences that responded. It was getting laughter. Orion never got it until the first weekend's grosses came in. Then they got it. Right. Um, right. Uh, I go through in the book all the screenings. I think I mentioned to you the other day, the, the NRG, the National Research Group, I called them up when I was writing the book, and I said, could you dig all these out? <laughs> and they, Torture. They scored, well, it was, yeah, because it scored poorly, yeah. even as it played great. And that yeah. was a curious thing. People laughed. There was spontaneous applause. And then we get these lousy numbers. Yeah. Um, and um, that's that I never quite figured out, except there is a chapter in the book called The Numbers Never Lie, except yeah. they do. Yeah. And, uh, so let me, uh, just, let me just interject that in addition to 220 movies at Universal and 27 features thereafter, um, the very best preview I ever attended in my life, the highest numbers, I've ever seen in my life was a really regrettable film that Universal made before I got there called Gable and Lombard, which we previewed at, previewed at the Waikiki 3 in Honolulu, I think as a gift to Sid Sheinberg who wanted a vacation or something. In any event, the worst preview I've ever seen was our first preview of The Deer Hunter in wow. Bloom, Bloomfield Hills the numbers were so bad, and Wasserman, because I'd spent so much money on the deer hunter, they were all over me. And Wasserman showed up, the chairman of the company showed up for that screening, and it was a horrible screening. And when the lights came up, we had about 60% of the audience left. They walked out in droves of the deer hunter, and Wasserman then tried to leave and got stuck in the elevator. So <laughs> it wasn't what I call a good day. <laughs> and... Uh, and um, since those are the yin and yang of it, Ron, I've never since that, since I saw that response to Gable and Lombard, I've never believed in preview, at previews as definitive. You know, the reason you go is to feel the audience. If the audience yeah. feels right, you're great. If they don't feel right, you can't fix it. Well, you can do a lot if nobody's filling out cards and there's people aren't running numbers and drawing the wrong conclusions from them. Yeah. I, I would like to sit in the middle of the theater away from partners. So you're just like, a, you can feel it. Yes. And if you can get two or three screenings where nobody's doing cards and nobody's, you know, ain't it cool new, all that. You can feel where it slows down. You can feel I can tighten that. Oh, the, we own the audience here. We can extend that moment. I have another moment I want to put back. So that's what you learn from these things, not these stupid uh, uh, percentages, which then drive how much money they put into marketing. That's the problem. with it. Yeah. So after the previews of Bull Durham, uh, what changes did you make in the movie? 
Well, there's one big one, and there's a whole chapter called Kill Your Darlings. Uh, and I, in the book, would, I'd print the whole scene and then talk about why we cut it out, what I learned, and what the battles were. And he, and he has a two-and-a-half-page monologue. Right. Alone in a bar, midday with Crash. Right. It's right after the scene, you recall, where she bursts into the boarding house where he's ironing a shirt in his shorts with a glass of scotch on the rocks on right. the ironing board. Yeah. And that that could be me in the minor leagues, and that was me in the minor leagues. And um, and they get into the big fight. She knocks over the ironing board and says, "This is the damnedest season I've ever seen. The Durham Bulls can't lose, and I can't get laid." Because now she's this is the Lysistrata story playing out. Where, uh, Crash has Nuke. Nuke is not uh, 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 going to bed with her, which was her idea, and Crash is now sustaining it. Um, so it's kind of a delicious twist, but they go to a bar. They go to the bar, Mitch's Tavern, still there in Raleigh, where uh, they met with Max Packett. And now it's a bar in the middle of the day. And they sit there, and he says, why baseball? And she tells the story of her life. Right. How she came to baseball, lost a parent, went to bury the parent, you know, and Thurman Munson is in it. Anyway. She's very poetic and lyrical about baseball. And if you find, if you know where home play, if you know where home is, you know where everything else is in relation to home. And Susan was brilliant. And we tested it in Orange County, down in Anaheim, and all the way back with my editor, Bob Layton. He said, he and I said, didn't the little the air go out of the room during our favorite scene? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We said. Yeah, it did. Why don't we tighten it? So we tightened it, screened it again. The air still went out of the room. Now, at the end of the scene, Jimmy and Millie, the young, the B couple, right. would come in and and announce that they've got engaged in the last four hours since they met. So there's a huge story point because there's a ballpark wedding coming up. And of course, Millie asks Annie to be the bridesmaid, which is kind of the irony. Let's take our favorite scene out of the movie. Forget the story, the plot point of marriage. Who cares? We'll just have a ballpark wedding. And um, and everybody protested. I mean, my producing partner protested, the studio president. I said, let's just see. And the movie played great. It just soared. It did. Took off. Did Susan Did Susan say anything about it not being in the movie? She was all, she's upset to this day. And, uh, yeah. and we're good friends, and I'm going to see her at a book signing in New York and all that. But... Uh, I said, I can't explain it. It probably cost her the Oscar, to be honest. Uh, um, and, and then I write in the book, what did I learn? Well, I learned that there was so much intimacy between them in the scene. Right. That is the kind of intimacy that you share after you've slept together, not before. Right. So in a certain way, the movie was over. Yeah, that's right. And, and the lesson for any writer is when we always struggle with when in a story do you reveal critical information? How much and when? How do you make sure you're not getting the audience isn't ahead of you? You know, and I just felt it was too intimate at the wrong time. And and, and when you think about the structure of, of of the movie, the whole last whatever it is ten minutes is their intimacy, right? Yeah, that's it. That, so yeah. so if you've given that away, I can kind of see this. Uh, at oh, the yeah. same time, I, I probably would have liked her backstory. There are things about it that I think might have uh, helped me know yeah. who she was better and so on. But I could also see by the, the, the uh, their getting together uh, it would have been anticlimactic, I think, perhaps, at that stage. Uh, that's, what I, that's what we felt, and it was the pain, right but painful decision. Yeah. So um, switching gears. I had a kid who worked for me named Mark Berg. He worked for me at Universal buying international films that had already been completed. So I kept him on an airplane for two or three years. And uh, Mark wanted to be a producer. When I left the studio, I took him with me in the company. I had not worked with him closely in that way, and I became unhappy with the guy. However, um, I was working, finishing the Polanski movie in Paris, shooting Jodie Foster thing in Philadelphia. And I had to get to Durham before we started shooting Bull Durham, just barely, by the way, maybe 24 hours. It was very tight. So I said to Mark, go down there, do whatever the fuck Ron needs, 
protect him, keep him out of trouble, don't do anything stupid. If you have a question, call me. Blah, blah. So I never heard from the guy as a first problem. So already I'm going like red alert here. The guy's not calling me. He's not that smart. This can't be working. At a certain point, you attempted to kill him. I thought that was a really reasonable move. Well, and and do you want to explain that to us? Well, I, again, I, I expand on this. Um, yeah, first of all, you know, I fought with Tom. I fought with Mark. I fought with Metaboy. I I get along with everybody. Still, I mean, I think I, my fights are like Earl Weaver. Okay, the fight's over. I made my point. Where are we drinking? Yeah. Uh, in the case of Mark, um, this was my third or fourth day of shooting. And we just finished dailies. We showed dailies in a room in the hotel and everybody comes, we have beer and, and the cast comes, the crew. I, 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 I love that ritual, which doesn't exist in the digital age. Everybody takes ownership. Uh, it becomes their movie. It's not my movie, it's our movie. And, and, and at the end of dailies, Susan enters with Mark, having just missed them. And I said, we'll run them again for you, Susan, don't worry. She said, well, I came because I heard I looked terrible in my close-up. Now, here's a 40-year-old woman, an actress, uh, and any actress is concerned about how they look. But when you get 40, you're, you like a person differently. That's just the way it works. And I said, who told you you look bad in your close-up? You look great in your close-up. And then she realizes that this came from Mark, not from me. And then I lost it. I said, Mark, did you tell her? Did you tell her? And, uh, and it's when you get angry in a bar fight or something, but pretty soon you can't not fight because it's, you're surging. And I grabbed him, and I put my hands on his throat, and I threw him on the ground, and then I drug him down the hall into my office. The people in my office were typing. They were running out, and I held him against the wall, and it was really ugly, honestly. Um, and uh, I, I, I finally went down the hallway to where a wonderful line producer, David Lester, who Tom had found, good, tough little Irishman. Yeah. I said, David, you're going to, he, he was really brilliant and holding that movie together. I said, David, you're going to get a call from either Tom, you weren't there that day, at, or, or uh, Tom, or the police, or the studio, or Mark Berg's lawyer, claiming that I tried to kill him, and it's all true. I don't know what. To, you're going to say about that. And David took a drag and a cigarette and said, I got it, we'll handle it. And nobody ever reported it. And the, uh, But what I'm told by crew members who I interviewed for the book, they said, oh, Ron, we, you owned us at that point. Yeah, you know. Well, I said, don't ever talk to my actors again. I, I realized I was being proprietary of my actors, and he didn't, nobody else did for sure. And, and then Kevin and, and uh, Tim were standing watching it, and they just said Cujo, and they nicknamed me Cujo. <laughs> I know, I remember. Well, then I mean, Kevin will, and Tim will occasionally call me Cujo uh, in an email. Uh, I love that it. reminds me of a quote: "The world is uh, made for people who aren't cursed with self-awareness." Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you've made an amazing number of really good movies, uh, sports movies like White Men Can Jump and Cobb and Tin Cup and a bunch of stuff that we've talked about. You've also made other kinds of films. Do you have more movies that speak to the human condition in you? Are you going to make some more movies? I hope so. I'm working harder than ever. I've got projects I love. Uh, you know, where the business is changing in front of us. Uh, it, it is different. It, you don't walk into a studio with a script and an actor anymore. It, it's, it's a little, as you know, Tom, it's, it's, there's a lot of moving pieces. Yep. Um, but I ever had more projects that are in in various pipelines, um, I, I, and you know I've, I've sort of given up and say I guess I'm the sports guy because that's that's what people want me to do. And there's an infinite number of stories set in this world. You know I I, I remember the great John Ford introduced himself once and said My name is Jack Ford and I make westerns. Well. Yep. He made more than Westerns, but yeah. we remember the Westerns. Yeah, that's absolutely so, true. Well, I guess I make things with balls in them. And, uh, uh, yeah, I want to keep working. They're going to have to drag me off the set, which they've been <laughs> trying to do before. <laughs> yeah. So, Ron, this book 
is, and I've read all the reviews now. I've looked at, you know, Publishers Weekly and Kirkus and, and uh, all over the place, New York Times. Great reviews, just consistently great reviews, and you deserve every bit of it. Are you going to write another book? I don't know. They, the publisher and the editor are, are so happy with it. They said, well, what's your next book? And I I don't know. I'm, I'm more concerned with my next movie, but yeah. um, I, yeah. I enjoyed it. I mean, I wrote it three scripts in the book in a 12 month period during the pandemic. So That's wonderful. Um, I love it. I, 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 ha I, I have to write. It's easier to, it's easier to write than to not write. So when you think about your life to date and because you're still a very young man and you've got easily, I mean, I worked with Lumet until he was 86, you know, and so you've got an easy 20 year window here to keep making some <laughs> wonderful movies. So, You've had a magical life, Ron Sheldon, from public high school on the wrong side of the tracks in Santa Barbara to here you are today with this book, which is undoubtedly going to be a bestseller, no question about it, and you will make more wonderful movies. And the movies you've made, I hope you are really proud of. Do you understand what a gift you've been given by the gods? Uh, I'm, I'm lucky, man. I, I, I also had, you know, I had parents who were supportive and uh, uh, just said, "What do whatever you want to do." You know, yeah. I wasn't forced down any road. Uh, leave the church? Yeah, good idea. We're thinking of leaving it too. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, and very um, low key. I dedicate the book to my parents and uh, who are long not with us. Yeah, um, but we're open-minded. They were, uh, by the way, conservative Republicans, who uh, back when that meant something very different. I mean, they, uh, my my father and mother, probably civil rights and equal rights was their more most passionate thing. They got angry about fighting for. Right. Uh, uh, my father worked <laughs> from West Texas and Bakersfield. His hero was Duke Ellington. He was a lover of jazz and played trumpet. So, um, you know, I think I think that varied background, uh, unpredictable set of things functioning, you know, uh, uh, together in, in a nourishing way, helped me be whoever I am. I, I'm very. They were very unjudgmental, and they had strong opinions. You know, uh, it was quite. And I and I think. My movies aren't terribly judgmental. Um, yeah, the, the villains for most of the movies are the uh, are the organization, which is an off-screen mythological beast. You know, the, right? The institutional thinking. Uh, I mean, who's the villain in Bull Durham? There's, you know, the organization. I don't know. There is no. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, as I said, you've never been great with organized linear authority figure. Uh, icons. So I'll just tell you one story and I want to thank you for this. Uh, you were kind enough to encourage us to have a premiere of Bull Durham in the Carolina Theater in downtown Durham. We inflated a 40 foot uh, uh, inflatable bull on the plaza in front of the theater. The entire town turned out, most of the town had been in the movie. They'd been sitting in the freezing cold in the seats with chewing on ice cubes to keep their breath from showing. And they all showed up. Among them, my mom. My mom had been a big enthusiast around this movie with the ladies who lunch at the country club, but she'd never seen a frame of it. So she uh, said to me on the way in, I drove over with my mom and dad. She said on the way in, um, th th there's nothing I'm going to be embarrassed about in this movie, <laughs> is there? <laughs> and I said, no, mom, of course not. <laughs> And she said, okay, I just want to be sure. I just want to be prepared. So the first thing is I we place filled up. I stu stood up on the stage, and I said, I'd just like to thank all of you for coming. I'd like to thank everybody for their hard work on the movie and for the support and blah, blah, blah. And just before we see this film, I want everyone to understand that there's only one person responsible for the inordinate amount of cussing in this movie, and that is my mom, who is sitting right over there. <laughs> and, and she never let me off the hook for that. Yeah. So, 
Anyway, yeah. Ron, you have given us all and the world some of the most literate, interesting, riveting entertainment of our lifetimes, some meaningful emotional connections, and we just are really delighted to thank you for it. Well, I'm happy to be here and join you guys and talk about something we made a long time ago that people are still talking about. Absolutely. This is uh, Bill Getty with Tom Mount reminding you that there are no shortcuts in show business, but there are many, many detours. This is Bill and Tom reminding you to take fountain.